So, um, uh, for those of you who weren't here uh, uh, earlier in the day, um, uh, it was a series of presentations honoring uh, Mike and Trilligrader, who for 40 odd years ran um, this remarkable colloquium series. And uh, when I came here shortly after Mark did in 98, uh, one of the first things people said is, you've got to go to the Marshat and you've got to find out what's going on there. It's remarkable. Uh, and um, Mike, with his hand on the tiller, um, presented a, a really incredible group of speakers, um, uh, some of the people at the very top of their game from across a wide variety of fields. And he was, in, in, in organizing that series, he was always just remarkably intellectually curious and broad. And I think it's very appropriate um, that we have Rob Kurzban speaking today, because as you'll see in just a moment, um, uh, his own interests are very much at the intersection of a variety of fields, um, uh, just the way uh, Mike tried to craft the, the, the colloquium series. So let me tell you a little bit about Rob uh, very briefly, and then um, uh, let's, uh, let's get to listen to his talk. So uh, Rob uh, currently is associate, soon to be full professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, one of the top psychology departments in the country. Um, uh, uh, recently, he also held the Rasmussen Chair in Economics at the um, uh, University of Alaska at Anchorage. And you might say, wow, it's the Department of Psychology and holds a chair in Economics. How does that work? Right? Well, uh, that's Rob. Okay? So he got his PhD with uh, Lita Cosmides and John Tooby at the University of California, Santa Barbara, some of the founders of the field of evolutionary psychology. Uh, his PhD is in psychology. He then promptly went off and did a postdoc with Nobel Prize winning um, economist Vernon Smith in economics. And then he came here to UCLA for several years uh, and to Caltech, where he was uh, the joint postdoc of Rob Boyd in anthropology and um, Colin Kammerer in economics at uh, Caltech. So what you see here is a, a consilience and inter, uh, intersection of um, economics, uh, psychology, um, anthropology, uh, sociology, a wide variety of social sciences uh, approaching human behavior from a scientific perspective. Um, and uh, he's uh, one of the very best um, in the business in any of those fields, and one of the few people who really masters um, the intersection of them. Uh, he's also the uh, editor-in-chief of Evolution and Human Behavior, uh, the premier journal in the evolutionary behavioral sciences. Um, and uh, if you're interested in um, uh, the general approach that he takes, in addition to his own work, I encourage you to, um, to look up the journal, because uh, both that and a very influential blog that he writes about evolutionary approaches on human behavior have had a wide impact. Um, uh, his publications are far too numerous to list. Um, uh, I gave up counting somewhere on the order of 100-odd. Um, uh, uh, some of the most weighty, if only in, in terms of um, actual physical weight, right, um, uh, as well as substance, are uh, uh, two books that he has. Um, uh, one which is out and another which will be out next fall. Um, the book published in 2010 is uh, Why Everyone Else is a Hypocrite, Evolution in the Logical Mind. And um, uh, the tentative title for the book to come out next fall is uh, Political Positions. And I understand that the ambiguity there is intentional. Um, let me just uh, give you a, a list of some topics that I pulled from the various uh, titles of many of his papers. Uh, so he's interested in, in evolutionary psychology, as I said, in experimental and behavioral economics, um, the use of game theory in explaining human behavior, something that uh, might um, uh, often put as a central point in both uh, talks and discussions in this series. Um, morality is uh, what he's talking about today, and that's a topic of much of his research, um, including related topics such as um, altruistic punishment and the evolution of cooperation, uh, revenge and forgiveness, friendship. Um, and you think, okay, I, I got it. I understand this kind of realm that this guy works in, right? But he also works on uh, the relationship between blood glucose and self-control, uh, moral disgust, um, the relationship between testosterone and generosity. He's written on the use of artificial selection in the control of malaria. Um, he has uh, an influential paper on speed dating, um, as well as uh, work on anxiety, and I think uh, one of the papers with the most uh, social significance, one on how it is possible to get people to become race blind, uh, that is to, to not process somebody else's uh, racial phenotype in a very short period of time. Um, and uh, up there with the uh, momentous and, and highbrow topics, he's also worked on country music lyrics and um, the psychology of superheroes. So you get a little bit of a picture of who Rob Kurzban is. I think um, you're going to enjoy the talk. Please join me in welcoming him. Uh, thank you for that uh, really kind introduction. It's a incredibly, I'm incredibly honored to be here at this colloquium series. Having just heard so much about it, I feel privileged and humbled to add to it to the extent that I can today. And I want to thank you all for having me and inviting me to take, take part in what's obviously a very special colloquial series. I'm just going to get right to it. I'm interested in this question, the functions of, um, that surround moral judgment. 
let me just tell you a little bit about, uh, about what I sort of think. What I'm going to be doing here is trying to talk about morality in a way that pushes against some other views. And for this audience, I'm not going to get into the details about what other people think about morality. And so in some sense, it's always difficult to understand what someone's saying unless you know who it is that they're trying to argue with. But nonetheless, what I'm going to try to say is, is really summarized by this notion that morality is not rainbows and unicorns with fluffy clouds. It's not virtue. It's not being good. That there's something going on strategically with what we call morality. And what I'm going to try to do for the rest of my time today is talk a little bit about how people use morality strategically in their social lives. And just to pick up on what Dan was talking about, where this is going to wind up, it's not in economics or necessarily psychology, sociology, or anthropology, but I'm going to be finishing off with political science, the next sort of area that, I, that sort of caught my attention. So um, this is a real basic look. This is how I think about uh, the non-human world. This is a world without morality. So I think that, not, not that anything turns on it, I think that morality is something which is, in some sense, at least the sense of the way I'm going to use the term, unique to humans, or almost unique to humans. But having said that, there's lots of kind and unkind transactions that occur in the non-human world. So lots of non-human animals and plants are going around trying to figure out how to extract benefits from victims, right? And often in the context of doing those things, these organisms are opposing costs, and organisms are designed to defend against that. So one way to think about this is that organisms are going around trying to get stuff for themselves, even at a cost of others, and you have perpetrators and you have victims, and the, the problem that perpetrators face is trying to extract benefits and avoid punishment. The problem that victims, potential victims face is to minimize these costs. And so what I've done there is go by, you probably can't see at the back, I love coming uh, to Southern California with these little pictures here, because this is a copyright infringement from The Princess Bride, the famous film. Uh, this is Guillermo Montoya, because my father forgot to die. No? Okay. Um, and so this is sort of the revenge icon here. And the, all I'm trying to say here is that in the natural world, there is violence being done from one unto others, and then revenge is the system that deters violence being done unto you. And this is extremely common. Right? This happens all the time. You see this in dog parks, you see this in plant interactions, and so on. What I want to talk about today is something which I think is not common in the biological world, which is this other thing that humans do, which is quintessentially a third-party transaction, something that organisms do with respect to what other two organisms are doing to one another. So I'm going to use this little green, green guy here, the moralizer. And what moralizers do basically is they evaluate others' behavior on the dimension of being wrong. They evaluate some actions as being wrong. And under certain circumstances, the social group to which people belong impose costs on individuals when they've done something which fits that category. <coughs> What I want to argue is that if you think about other organisms' transactions, they don't do this. In essence, organisms don't really care about what's going on with unrelated individuals who are not either their kin or their <coughs> allies or somehow um, have some kind of interest in them. But humans care a lot. And some of the best work on morality has been done uh, here by Dan Fessler and others. Um, so I think this presents a puzzle. The question is, in some sense, why are humans such busybodies? Why do we care? what other members of our species are up to when they're not our allies, the people they're damaging are not our allies, and so on. So I got interested in this question, which is, it looks like <coughs> the human mind consists of a system that's designed to evaluate others' actions and desire that they be punished when they do things that correspond to these wrong acts. And I think there's still this lingering question, which is why? What is the story? Why is it that humans want other people to be punished for doing things like taking other people's stuff, or eating two <coughs> foods that are in some particular combination, or using a particular word that's prescribed for a particular culture, the list is more or less endless. So that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. Why are, why are uh, humans so interested in what people are doing and want them to be punished for doing various kinds of things? And just to be clear, and this speaks to this issue of what it is that I'm focusing on in terms of the research question, I'm really not interested in the question of why people do nice things. Sometimes when people talk about morality, they're talking about why do people conform to moral rules? Why are they generous? Why do they uh, stop at the intersection when people are crossing a crosswalk, as one does here in Los Angeles, but one never does in Philadelphia? Right? I'm not interested in that question. I'm interested in the, this other question, why do people care about what other people's, people are up to and judge them as being wrong and desire that they be punished for doing those things? And this is important because there's some people who talk about morality, and what they're talking about really is that first thing as opposed to that second thing, and I just want to direct your attention to that second thing. 
The answer to this question, and I'm not going to go through this in uh, tremendous detail for this audience, the, the usual answer to this question about why people are moralistic creatures typically is located in the, the notion that humans are social organisms who cooperate towards joint goals. And what I'm going to do is try to suggest that that's not at all what's going on. That's not the underlying function of moral, of moral systems. That's not why we're moralistic creatures. And I want you to think a little bit about one thing that's interesting, and, and uh, Dan alluded to this in his introduction. One of the things that's really weird about humans is that when we fight with each other in groups, we can switch sides. We can take uh, one side of political conflict or the other side of political conflict. We don't always, but if you look at critters like um, baboons, if you look at any uh, organism which is organized along kin lines, these organisms, they don't switch sides, they always take the side of their kin. And humans are flexible in the groups that we form. So what I want you to do is imagine a human social group where people have some good friends, some more distant <coughs> friends, and occasionally conflicts break out in that social group. And other people who are in that social group are potentially faced with the, the question of whose side are they going to take. I'm not arguing that people always take sides in conflict. I'm arguing that often people do take sides in conflict. So one way that you could imagine that people could would, could take sides is they would always side in a conflict with the person who is their closer friend. And so I just choose based on my close, the closest to my relationship. So you know I, I like Dan more than I like Clark, let's just say. Whenever they get into a fight, I take Dan's side, independent of the source of the conflict. So the important point here is that I'm not choosing sides based on the behaviors of the organisms. I'm choosing it based on my relationship to the organisms. In most social network structures, and there's some simulation data that we have on this, in most social network structures, because of the way that friendship groups are structured, when that occurs, <coughs> if everyone chooses the same the, the side of the person who they're closer friends with, you get a large number of relatively evenly matched fights. <coughs> and that you can kind of imagine in a social world where there's lots of connections among individuals, that the, the way that the friendship structures uh, exist is such that you, you have a network that looks kind of like that, and if you take any two particular individuals on that network, some people are going to be closer to one, some people are going to be closer to the other. And you, so what winds up happening is you get large numbers of evenly matched fights. And in, in the biological literature, <coughs> biolog generally, when you have evenly matched fights, you have very costly fights, right? So the, the, the cheapest <coughs> fight to get into is one in which one organism is extremely big and powerful and one is really small because the small guy recognizes that's going to lose and so it retreats. And the big guy doesn't have to pay any cost of fighting. And so in some sense, they're both better off. But that doesn't happen when you have evenly matched fights. So the problem with a world in which you choose based on your friendship structure is that the social world winds up having large numbers of evenly matched fights. There's another way to do it, which was what you see in dominance hierarchies in lots of other organisms, which is you could just choose based on the rank. So let's say that Dan is higher rank than Clark. In virtue not of their behavior, again, but in virtue of that ranking information, every time they get into a conflict, I take Dan's side. What, what happens in that case is that Dan now can get into any kind of conflict he wants with impunity because he knows that as the top monkey, with all due respect, um, he's always going to win. He's always going to win the fight. So this empowers dictators. So from the perspective of third parties, from the, my perspective, the first solution leads to a large number of costly fights, and the second solution leads to empowering a dictator who then has power over me. So the argument is that these are bad ways for individuals to choose sides. I want you to imagine a slightly different way. Suppose that every time Clark and Dan got into a fight, we flipped a coin and we all agreed if it's all of us, we agreed if it's heads, we're going to take Dan's side, and if it's tails, we're going to take Clark's side. So they get into a fight, flip the coin, there's some 50-50 there's probability in each case. The nice thing about that is that we all wind up on the same side of the conflict, getting back to the case where you have one really powerful organism and one very weak organism. You have a highly asymmetric conflict in which everyone knows who's going to win and everyone knows who's going to lose. So then we impose the cost or whatever it is. We decide, okay, Dan wins, Clark loses, and the conflict is over. So the nice thing about deciding before conflicts break out, that if you're going to use a correlated equilibrium, some mechanism which is decided ex ante regarding which side observers are going to take, is that you wind up with highly asymmetric fights that minimize aggregate costs. Now, it's true that you can't decide beforehand who's going to win, and so getting into a conflict carries a potential cost. But from the perspective of third parties, third parties are better off insofar as they don't wind up having the same problems that I alluded to in the prior slide. Now I want you to imagine a slightly different solution, which is 
instead of looking at the identities of participants, and instead of flipping a coin, what we do is we look at what they did, and everyone sides against the person who performed the action that was wrong or morally um, prohibited. You get the same result as in the prior bullet point, that is everyone winds up on the same side, assuming, assuming we all agree about how to parse the actions of the participants. And we've all managed to avoid the problems of uh, the friendship mechanism and, and the dictator mechanism. And now what we do is we use the actions of the participants so that we, we reduce the costliness of fights in a social group when they, when they emerge. So the argument here is that you can think about this rule about who to side with as moral contents, right? So the person who stole, the person who um, imposed intentional harm, the person who ate the whatever, the sacred food or whatever it is, that person has done something morally really wrong, we all side against that person. We think, the, the nice thing about this is that you can, this is sort of the pictorial representation, so uh, this actually ties into superhero work. You can see Wonder Woman is there. She represents all third party observers. What happens is that uh, uh, Bart Simpson there, he steals Barney Rubble, whatever that is, extremely large pork chop. And uh, all the third party observers seeing those actions, Barney has, or, uh, Bart has stolen the, the pork chop. They use that action to side against him, and all of the Wonder Womans wind up on the same side. And the nice thing is that this allows for coordination against the same person, but it leads to another interesting problem, which is going to be the, the, what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk, which is that once we've decided that we're going to use a basket of rules, don't steal, don't break contracts, don't hurt, and so on, to arbitrate fights, once we're going to use those rules to decide who we're all going to side against, then you have fights over what those rules are going to be. And what I'm going to try to argue is that each one of us is going to be better off in some, some circumstances and worse off in other circumstances depending on the contents of those rules. But an important point here is that on this view that I'm trying, trying that I'm proposing, the way you shouldn't think about moral rules as ways that we use to get along with each other per se or to lead to group cooperative outcomes. What I'm trying to say is that the moral condemnation that we use is simply a way to arbitrate conflicts. And once we have rules that cover all the different kinds of conflicts that people might get into, then we start fighting over what these rules are going to be. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk in the papers that I'm sure uh, that, that you know, people who visit my website are, are very welcome to peruse. We think, and when I say we, this, these ideas were developed in largely in collaboration with my former student, Peter Schulli. We think that we can explain a large number of the different properties of morality which I will discuss in detail here. But what I will do is this last point, which is I think it helps to explain why there's such great fights over moral, moral contents. And in particular, I'm going to talk a little bit about fights over moral contents at various different time scales. And just to set this up, where I'm going to wind up by the end here is a discussion about how people are using morality to implement what is good for them in terms of their self-interest. So these are just some quotations from David Sears, a name known to many of you here at uh, UCLA. He writes uh, with Carolyn Funk, self-interest ordinarily, or ordinarily does not have much effect on the mass public political attitudes. Charles Tabor writes, unless the material outcomes from a public policy or issue are very clear, very large, or very imminent, self-interest does not determine opinion or action. Brian Kaplan says self-interest has no more than sporadic marginal effects on political views. And perhaps the leading academic light in this literature, John Heights, is self-interest is a weak predictor of policy preferences. I want you to bear those in mind as we go through. In political science, among academics at least, there's a strong view that you can't explain people's political views with reference to their self-interest. So I'm going to finish this talk with three different lines of uh, experimental work. And I'm going to first just talk a little bit about two possibilities in terms of how people make moral judgments. So, and this is an exaggeration, I'm not trying to say that it has to be the case it's one or the other. These are the sort of the endpoints of the scale. So one possible position you might take, and I, I used to think that this was in fact John Hyde's view until I went to NYU and he claimed it wasn't. So I'm still not quite sure what his view is. But you can imagine that people have, have little traits. That is, they, there's individual differences and they make their moral judgments based on some individual difference variable. So I have a particular commitment to being a liberal or to being um, pro-social or to being conservative or whatever it is. And then I have that philosophical standpoint and then for any given policy view or for any given moral view, I consult what my sort of type is, to put it in the game theoretical context, 
And I use that type to determine what my position is going to be. The other end of this axis is a more state-like interpretation, which is I figure out where my interests lie and I adopt a moral view based on my interests. So the first one, letter A there, would be something like the mainstream view in sociology and uh, to some extent public science, which is that you grow up and you adopt the philosophical positions of your parents, and then you bring to bear those philosophical positions when you're taking your own stances with respect to particular political opinions. The other one, this more dynamic view, is that you just figure out where your interests lie and figure out what moral rule would be good to advance your interests. So, if you take the first view, yeah. In the second view, you are not uh, assuming conscious computation. We're talking about usually an unconscious computation. Yeah, being, right. So the question is, am I assuming conscious computation? And the answer is no, I'm not. I, I'm indifferent on that. Thanks for the question. So if you think that these views are, are trait-like, then they should be relatively stable. Right? If I'm getting my moral positions by consulting my underlying philosophical commitments, then these things ought to be stable. On the other hand, if my um, intuitions about what is morally right depend on my self-interest or my self-interest is changing in some kind of dynamic way, then you ought to be able to push these things around a little bit. So I'm just going to talk really quickly about an experiment. So this is, as Dan indicated, I wear another hat as behavioral economist. So that's the technique that we use in, in this first line of work. What we do is we tell people they're going to play a two-player game. It's a relatively simple game. And you can think of this as learning the rules of the game behind the Rawlsian veil. That is, you don't know what role you're going to play in the game. I just tell you the rules. I don't tell you who you are in the game. And I'm going to ask you, given the rules of the game, without knowing who you are, how good, bad, fair, unfair would different decisions be? So they're basically saying, behind the veil, how nice is it to do this, or how fair is it, or how unfair is it to do that? Then I lift the veil. I say, OK, you're going to occupy this role. I have them play the game, and then I ask them exactly the same question as I did previously. So the idea here is to solicit people's moral intuitions before they know where their interests lie, let them play the game, identify where their interests lie, and ask them exactly the same question again. And when I say exactly, I mean exactly. We're actually using literally the same screen on the computer when they give us their answers. So the idea here is that if intuitions of fairness are state-like, then moral evaluations of options should move in a direction consistent with self-interest. And let me show you the instructions so you get a sense of the task. Here's the little task that we, that we developed. And again, I say we, this is working in collaboration with my friend and colleague, Michael Peterson, Alex Shaw, and get them actually. So this is a real simple task where people are basically just typing. We thought of, we want to do this over the internet, so we wanted something that people could do relatively easily on the internet. One person participant is the typist, and the other one is the checker. The typist transcribes three paragraphs. The checker transcribes just one. So all we've done here is we've produced a world in which one person is doing three times as much work as the other. It's not a lot of work. These uh, techniques just last a few minutes. Then what's going to happen is there's going to be a $2 pie that gets split. And remember, when you first learn about the task, you're not told what your role is. So what we do is we explain the task. Remember that the the rules are going to be assigned randomly, but one does three times as much as the other. So you could justify the view that the money should be split evenly, given that the rules were assigned randomly. But you might also be able to justify the idea that the ratio of reward should be three to one, given that one individual does three times as much work as the other. So we just ask people, do you think it's fair or morally justified to divide the earnings according to work? 75% for the typist and 25% for the checker. And we ask the same exact questions for the 50-50 split. And we use a nine-point sliding scale, which I'll show you here. We use a sliding scale because we were worried that if we just had people answer on a scale of one to nine, because people do have a motive to remain relatively consistent in their moral views, people would simply try to recall what it is that they had previously said and simply answer that. So this reduces the probability of memory effects. So what we do is we have this nice little slider. Um, we convert the point on the slider from a, a number between minus four and positive four, or whatever it was. Um, and this is labeled very fair at one end and uh, very unfair at the other end. So this is what they're going to see. And remember, they're going to see this twice. Here's the rules of the game. Here's the scale. Play the game. Answer the question again. So remember, the rules are assigned. You have the decision made by the typist. The typist is the one who's going to be allocating the money. They only have two choices. It's either going to be a dollar, 50, 50 cents, or an even split of a dollar, a dollar. And then again, they do the second round of judgments. 
And what I'm going to be showing you here in the next slide is the, is the different score. So what I want to show you is how much more fair do typists think it is to divide the money, a dollar fifty fifty in their favor, after they've done the task than they did beforehand, right? So, and that's what you're seeing there on the left-hand side, the blue. Um, what you see is that typists decide after they've done the task and been assigned the role, it actually turns out the three to one split is less unfair than they thought it had been prior to the roles and veil being lifted. And they also decide that it's now, it's a little bit more unfair, actually it's about a, a full point. This isn't bad for psychological research, it's a nice point Michael Michael scale. Typists say, you know what, splitting it 50-50, that actually turns out that's not as, not as fair as I thought it previously had been. And you get reciprocal effects for the checkers, although look, they're a tiny bit smaller. So the, the moral of this story is that hardworking typists come to see the 50-50 split as more unfair after the bail has been lifted. So their view about what is fair and unfair depends on where their interests lie once they figure out where their interests lie. All of the action is in the typists who make the choice to chew, to uh, split the money three to one. So if you just look at the typists who were even splitters, you don't see the same effect. Uh, that's 13 of our 47 typists. So the bulk of our typists do split the money three to one in their own favor. And you can see the raw, the raw values there. They're moving over about a point on the scale, and the same thing is going on there for the, um, for the raw stuff. So in other words, you have to look from this, you would say it helps to actually engage in the behavior which is self-benefiting that seems to be important in driving the effect of the change in the moral views over the three or four minutes the experiment takes place. We ran a between subjects version just to make sure there wasn't something funny going on. Um, we, we, in some sense, we should have run this one first because this is the one where you would think you'd be most likely to get the result. We, we ran the prior one thinking that we weren't going to be able to move people's judgments about fairness in the space of five minutes in this task. So it was sort of like we thought that was a more aggressive method, and we got it, but we thought we'd backtrack. Uh, so I'm presenting this to you not in, in a way that is necessarily logically less coherent. This is the, this is the less interesting finding, uh, but it, is, it does respect the way that we uh, actually did the work. So what you see here is that this is now um, where there's, there's no pre-evaluation of the fairness or versus unfairness. We just assign people to their roles, and we ask them which way do you think is fair or unfair to, to uh, distribute the money. And not surprisingly, these are quite large effects. So a typist think that it's quite, you, know, you, can, you can see there, uh, it's quite fair to do a three to one split. Checkers don't think that's the case. And the same thing you see from morally wrong. Right? So basically, um, I think that the decision that benefits me is pretty fair, and the decision that doesn't benefit me is less so which is less surprising than between them and within subjects. We did another <coughs> control where we had equal work. And here, not surprisingly, the three to one split is viewed as unfair by pretty much everybody. But after the bail, checkers now really think that the 50-50 split is, is the fair thing to do. So they go even further along this dimension. So again, not terribly surprising, but at least consistent with this idea that people are, moved, are, are, that, that people are drawing their moral views about, about fairness and so on in a way that corresponds to where they're just lying. Um, so checkers come to see a 75 point by split as more uh, unfair after bail has been lifted again, not particularly surprisingly. So the summary from that is that people's, what people say they think of as, as fair or morally wrong is quite labile and quite dynamic and moves in a way which is completely incomprehensible in the context of where their interests lie. What we think is interesting about this line of work is how small a time frame you can get people to shift their moral judgments around. What I want to do now is transition to another sort of time scale. This is work by Michael Peterson and some of his colleagues. He's Danish, and they had access to the Danish election survey, which is, uh, as you can see, 586 people. And one of the measures on the scale is this, this one here. Many of the unemployed don't really want to find work, and too many get social welfare without needing it. You can think of this as more or less something a little bit like support for increased or decreased welfare. I mean, this is Denmark, so they care a lot about the world. Not that we don't care about the welfare state, but they care a lot about the world of welfare state. And Michael Peterson said, as you heard from Dan, I've, I've got interest in the role of blood glucose uh, for reasons that are not particularly important. But one of the things that they were, that they were able to do is ask what seems like an odd question at first, which is, does, does your position on the social welfare transfers depend on whether or not you just need it? So right now, uh, you've got uh, many people here who just had the uh, opportunity to eat lunch, even if you didn't lunch, you probably ate lunch somewhere. 
uh, I'm about to show you some data that suggests that it's fairly likely that your views about the role of the federal government in moving wealth from wealthy people to less wealthy people have changed dynamically just over the last several hours. So what, and the argument is as follows. When you're, when you're hungry, it could very well be that you want to encourage a, the world to be one such that other people think it's a good idea for people to share stuff. Right? So organisms who aren't doing too well are better off in a world in which those, in which outcomes are leveled by taking from the rich and giving to the poor. Conversely, organisms are doing quite, quite well, who are, who are satiated. They sort of are doing well enough that they sort of feel like, well, maybe the world should be one in which everyone gets to keep their stuff. That's the thing. So in the first case, you become egalitarian because you're in, uh, at least for an acute moment of time, you're in need. And when you're not in need, you think property rights are a good idea. People ought to be able to keep what they have because I'm actually doing pretty well. So he had this idea, which I grant as an aggressive, uh, no, I mean, so an aggressive hypothesis. But all he did was he took the survey data from people who had eaten mm -hmm. lunch and people had just, it was time stamped, so he was able to look at people who had, had taken the survey you know, between an hour or so before the official lunchtime and an hour or so after. And he looked at where people fall on these scales, and what he finds is, just as he predicted, that people change their views on egalitarianism depending on when they took the survey. So as you become less, as you become, uh, there's a negative sign there, which is the right sign, this is to say, as you become less hungry, you become less inclined towards egalitarian Danish social welfare transfer policies. Right? So you start to like the idea that people should keep their stuff, and the government shouldn't take their stuff as you become more satiated. So maybe that was a, could have been a fluke, maybe there was something funny about the sample. So what they did is they brought it into a laboratory. So they took 100 people, and those people were asked either to drink Sprite or Sprite Zero. So Sprite Zero has artificial sweetener, so there's no glucose in it. They do measurements pre and post, so when they arrive, 10 minutes after drinking and then before leaving, and now they can ask whichever questions they want in terms of social welfare. So for example, we should increase the benefits of social welfare of recipients receive. That bottom picture there, by the way, that's just the way you measure glucose off the blood. And so again, the prediction is that the people who have had the glucose should be less inclined towards egalitarian, egalitarian social policies, and the, the statistics here don't matter. I put the reference up there, QP, 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 evidence, experimental evidence in favor of you that something surprising like the amount of, of glucose circulated through your circulatory system is influencing your political views in a way that's comprehensible in the context of this argument regarding your interests. So just to sort of set up this last piece, again, I wasn't sure who would be attending. There are some people here at UCLA who are quite wedded to the view uh, that self-interest doesn't matter. So this is a quotation uh, by Kinder in 1998. When faced with affirmative action by the black Americans, when they are come to their views without calculating personal harms or benefits. The unemployed do not line up behind policies designed to alleviate economic distress. The medically indigent are no more likely to pay for government health insurance than are fully insured. So, in the first experiment, I was showing you that people's moral positions on fairness change within a few minutes. In the second experiment, I was showing you that over the course of hours, people's views change. This is a lifetime story. This is a story about where people's political views wind up given various factors having to do with life history. So the, the sort of benchmark here is this claim that um, people's views on affirmative action, unemployment, and the role of the government in medicine don't depend on how those particular policies are going to help or hurt them. So I just want to show you some results from the general social survey. Right? So in terms of the context of affirmative action, you would think that if, if you think that affirmative action views are derived from your interest, people should oppose it if they, if they aren't of the advantage category and believe that the policy reduces their or their friends um, of getting a job. So if, so if I'm a member of the particular uh, category, or if I'm not, so suppose I'm an African American, and I think that, that I'm, the policy is going to have an effect on me, you can imagine that people would differ 
whether or not it does, right? So if, you, if you're an African American with extremely high so, um, human capital, then affirmative action, action isn't going to really affect you one way or the other. On the other hand, if you have low social capital, that might. So the self-interest view predicts that African Americans with low social capital who think that they are particularly going to be benefited in the case in which there are affirmative action policies, that those are the individuals who should be differentially likely to support affirmative action. So the biggest supporters we find in the Dow Social Survey are African Americans who indicated that it's likely that they or a family member will lose a job or promotion to a white, by a margin of 62% uh, or 22% against. The biggest opponents of affirmative action are white, whites who indicated that it is likely that they or a family member will lose a job or promotion to an African American. Now the number goes to 8% for support, 77 is strongly opposed. So we don't know how else to interpret these data other than the interest that people bring to bear on this particular policy issue is having, I mean, in, in this world of political science world, a few percentage points is often made a big deal out of. And this is a huge swing in terms of these demographics. We see the same thing on unemployment. Um, when we ask for the government's responsibility to provide the decent standard of living the unemployed, 74% of the unemployed think it should be, 46% uh, working full-time at rate. Again, a spread of about 30 points. Same thing for, um, this is, an unemployment issue, but another 30 point spread, 57% of the unemployment which can increase, 27% of those working full time to free, and the same thing is true for health insurance. These are not cherry picked examples. We picked examples from Kinder and from other sources where they specifically made claims about whether or not people's interests ought to influence their political policies. <coughs> By the way, the other view is that what's going on is that people are just generically liberal or conservative, and they take the policy position based on their party or their ideology as opposed to their interests. What we're trying to say is it doesn't, it doesn't look that way to us. And here, us is Jason Whedon, who's the co-author of the book that Dan mentioned, and uh, very generous with your remarks. Okay, so my own work in this area, I was interested in one particular issue, which is now, and all, uh, gotten a lot of press because of the recent changes in laws in uh, Washington and Denver and Colorado and elsewhere, which is about recreational drug use. So there's this puzzle, which I think is important for students of morality to understand some of these really strange bits why do humans care so much if other humans inhale smoking leaves and makes them, you know, hallucinate or feel kind of relaxed or whatever? Cure mm -hmm. their glaucoma or get the munchies, whatever it is, right? Um, this is a puzzling thing about humans. Why do you care about this? So, again, just like Michael Peterson, our claim here is a little adventurous. We agree that this is an aggressive claim. And so, basically, what we're going to what we argue is that what's going on with opposition to other people smoking drugs is that this is really just a way for people to oppose other people having a lot of sex. And what we're going to do is I'm going to show you some data that we gathered where we're going to measure people's abstract political ideology. Are you a conservative? Are you a Democrat? Blah, blah. We're going to measure how much you don't like other people to use recreational drugs. And we're going to ask you some questions about your sexuality. Again, the opposing view on this, at least to our eye, and I've given some talks to political science departments, and I don't get a lot of pushback about this, is that the mainstream political science view says people are born into the world, they're either uh, conservative or liberal, those ideologies lead to their individual policy positions, whether it's about drugs, and it also leads to your positions with respect to sex. See, it's a funny time, right? And so if that's true, if you control for people's abstract political views, the correlations between sexual strategy and drug use, drug use should be attenuated. I don't know what the, I mean, it's a mathematical colloquium, so many of you might have statistical chops. The details don't matter here. The point is that the mainstream view <coughs> makes relatively straightforward predictions about the relationship. Um, so returning to where I began, moral contents are funny things. If they're just mechanisms that we use to coordinate, and there's the second order game being set up, then there's going to be some rules which we all kind of like because I'm not better off or worse off if they're implemented. So rules against intentional harm are like this. If, if there's a rule against intentional harm, it's true I can't knock Dan over the head and take his stuff, but on the other hand, he can't knock me over the head and take my stuff. That is, if we do, we get punished. So that deters harm. And anybody who can be harmed benefits in that rule regime, and that's just everybody. We refer to these as Rawlsian rules because more or less they affect everyone equally. That's not exactly true when it's close, right? So if you're a really big guy with a gun, then you're, you're not protected by the rule as much as a little guy with that gun. But roughly that's true. But there's some rules which are really asymmetric. So uh, when Napster came out, right, uh, people who were really opposed to this idea that 
uh, people should be able to, that to facilitating the movement of digital music with the people, with the, with the record companies and the bands, right? Because they want a rule regime that says you can't steal music. People who consume music want a rule regime that says, you know what, information should be free. Information should be free, it sounds great when you say it out loud, but it also basically means I want to be able to take people's stuff, right, without paying for it. And they're both, in some sense, defensible and moral positions, but the claim here is that the way to think about these different positions have to do with the locations of people's self-interest, as opposed to their ideological commitments. So, um, I'm not going to go through this argument in detail, uh, just very, this is in the couple of papers where we've discussed this, but more or less the story goes like this. If you are a monogamous investing dad, this is used males for, for, for the example, the biggest threat to your reproductive, a big threat to your reproductive success is the probability that your mate is going to have sex with another individual outside of the monogamous bond. So this ties into returning certainty, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. So it would be nice for monogamous investing males to live in a world in which third parties enforce the rule that people shouldn't be having a lot of sex, which diminishes the chance that their mate is going to stray. If your mate risks punishment for engaging in this kind of sexuality, and other people also risk uh, punishment for engaging in various kinds of in these kinds of uh, sexual transactions, then that deters the very threat that is biggest to you as an investing male. On the other hand, if you are a promiscuous male who is investing a lot of time in mating, mating effort as opposed to parenting effort, you want to live in a world in which lots of sexuality is not punished, in which you can implement your strategy in virtue of the fact that it's permissible to engage in large numbers of sexual transactions. So if that's true, then we should be able to predict your moral views on sexual activity in virtue of your sexual strategy. What you're doing sexually should give us the, the position that you take morally and politically. So we know that people, that as a matter of, as a fact about the world and a, a matter of what people's beliefs are about the world, that there are links between recreational drug use and promiscuity. Right? So when people think about what's going on with recreational drug use in this country, they think about the 60s and they think about lots of sex. Right? And so what that suggests is that if, if the model that, that we're proposing is right, this model, which is that the sexual items are essentially measuring people's self-interest, so these are items like how many partners have you had in the last six months, is sex without love okay, Essentially, we're measuring whether you're, you're using a promiscuous mating effort strategy or an investing parenting strategy. Right? That's the uncaused cause of the model. The prediction is that that should relate very well to your drug attitude. And if you control for the, the sexual stuff, the relationship between the abstract items and the drug uh, items will be diminished. And if you control the abstract items, in this case, you're controlling for something which is not the antecedent causal variable, that shouldn't diminish the other relationship all that much. And that's the key prediction. Right? And again, for those people who are not interested in these sorts of models, um, the, the point is that the two, causal, the two causal stories make different correlational predictions. So I'm going to be showing you correlational data, and we get the difference between causation and correlation. We, I, I promise you, we understand that relationship. Having said that, if you have a causal theory, you are required to make certain kinds of predictions and correlations, right? So because once you have causality, that's going to, it's going to lead to things happening in the real world that are correlated with each other, right? So if you have a theory about raindrops, if there's no relationship between rain and umbrellas, you've got a bad theory about what keeps people dry. Okay. So these are the things that we measure. Opposition to drugs, well, the geosity, again, assessing your sexuality, which is going to be a big part of our story. Um, a bunch of other stuff. You can imagine what we were interested in. Basically, we're trying to quantify ideology, where you fall on these political measures. We're trying to quantify your sexual strategy, and we're trying to quantify your opposition to drugs, which we do in the most sort of straightforward way we can think, which is just to ask about your opposition to recreational drug use. We say a person is going to use everything from aspirin to cocaine. Is this morally wrong or should it be legal? It's literally to ask the question. There are many things that surprise us uh, in, in these the lines of research. I just want to be kind of forthright. It, it turns out that there's a button. People who are opposed to people using cocaine are also opposed to people using echinacea and aspirin. We don't really have a good story about this, except it's a, a, it, we don't really have a good story about this. So these things load really heavily on each other for reasons that surpass understanding. Uh, but the good news is that we didn't really need to do anything fancy with the analysis because we just basically got one drug opposition measure that gets everything really strange. Okay. So we, uh, just like uh, everybody does, just mostly to annoy our friends in anthropology, we first used undergraduates uh, in the United States. Using a, 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 another sample, we got people 
across the nation. So these are users of Amazon's mechanical Turk. This is just a way to get data from a better population somehow than just a student population. And I will be showing you some data from other countries as well. Uh, so that Dan doesn't throw tomato at me. So these are the raw correlations. I know those are small. All you need to know is that the biggest predictors of people's opposition to recreational drug use are their sociosexual orientation, their measures of um, how disgusted they get about various kinds of sexual transactions, and some political issues that we, we ask them with respect to uh, sexual transactions, so prostitution and so on. So the best predictor in the undergraduate example was sociosexual, so sociosexual orientation. So if you want to know someone's views on recreational drug use, but you're shy, you don't want to say, hey, how do you feel about legalizing marijuana? Instead, you can just get at the sociosexuality con uh, construct and say, hey, how many sexual partners have you had last six months? <laughs> so that'll save you some embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> so remember, the key prediction here is that if you control for the uh, non-sexual stuff, we shouldn't see diminished relationships in the relationship between the sexual stuff and drugs. And again, these things, they do diminish a little bit, but I'll, I'll, not all that much. But if you now look at the, the so then the, the, everything from the fourth line down is what's the relationship between political ideological things and opposition to drug use, right? So there's raw correlations, they start out smaller, that's okay. But then what we do is we uh, control for the sexual stuff, and those things tend to diminish down until they're no longer significant, which implies uh, some, so it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't establish, but that is at least what is predicted by the causal model that I presented second. One that, that, that says that the antecedent upstream causal variable is sexual orientation and sexual stuff. That's undergraduate, so what about real people? Uh, this is the answer <laughs> sample. Once again, you see very similar first order relationships between drug use and then sexual stuff in the, in, the neighbor, in the same neighborhood. And we run the same analysis, and almost everything goes away. So if we control for the sexual stuff, then the relationship between the height scales and Geosity and the big five, these things all diminish basically. I understand going to Belgium does not satisfy our friends who work with the Bongo Bongo or whatever it is. It's you know hard to gather these data, um, but we made some effort. So, in more recent work, and this is a collaboration with um, a number of people who were able to get data in Europe and in Japan, we show very similar effects among Belgians, almost exactly the same effects among the Dutch. And with some funny exceptions of the Japanese, we actually had to change a bunch of stuff for the Japanese. We worked quite hard with our Japanese collaborator to figure out what kinds of questions would be comprehensible. Uh, the, the picture in Japan doesn't work quite as nicely. The uh, first order correlations behave relatively well, um, but you can see there that if you control, for example, the non-sexual stuff, the, the sexual disgust item goes away. The details here are not too important. At least we have some evidence that it's more or less behaving in a way that's relatively similar to, our, to what's going on in the United States. So, what I'm trying to persuade you of is a couple things. The first thing is the way to think about moral contents. We think it's profitable to think of them not as ways that cultures arrange themselves to lead to cooperative outcomes. And I slow down to say that, because this, I would argue, and people in the front row here can screw me, I believe that many people in in and around the kinds of disciplines that at least I travel in, take that view. That moral contents are for leading to group-wise cooperative outcomes. Whether that's in virtue of a genetic selectionist argument or cultural group selection argument, that has been, I take it, more or less one of the, I think that I, it's fair to characterize that as the predominant view, at least in some sectors. I, our view takes the, the position that moral contents, rather than thinking of about them as ways to get to group-wide optimal outcomes is that they're just coordinated equilibrium devices. They're ways to get everybody on the same side of when conflicts emerge. Now, I, am, I also want to rapidly concede that our model, just like some of the models that one sees in, in the work of people like Robert Boyd, Peter Richardson, Robert Boyd was here at UCLA up until recently, we expect similar epidemiological effects. So if it's true that there's multiple equilibria, and it's also true that some of these equilibria do have better group-wide outcomes than others. And over time, groups with better norms should get bigger, richer, stronger, faster, and so on. I totally concede that point. Um, 
And, and I, I also concede, and I've, I've said this publicly before, I'm happy to talk about, as an empirical matter, what are the differences between the kinds of views that, that we see in people like Boyd Richardson and the ones that we're endorsing, and how to distinguish these kinds of things. We think that one thing that is puzzling, if you take a relatively hardcore view of uh, Boyd Richardson, is how frequently social welfare destroying norms seem to recur and persist. Prohibitions on interest, prohibitions on mutually beneficial transactions, all sorts of non consequentialist <laughs> moral judgments. We find I, we find that strange in the context of the of, of a certain version of the cultural evolution view. I'm not saying it's inconsistent with it or it's a slam dunk, but there seem to be a lot of moral contents that are good for agents, that is good for actors who make the rules, and less and less good for the groups in which. And I say that. By the way, I don't. I kept my watch up. But since I do have five minutes, I will generate into this really neat story, which I just read about, which was about um, Venice in the Middle Ages. So in Venice in the Middle Ages, they developed contracts where entrepreneurs could go to people who had wealth. So you have land-bound, wealthy people from families who had accumulated wealth over time, and then you had merchants who didn't have capital, but they did have a sense of adventure, and they had ships. And so they would form a contract that says, okay, you give me your capital, I'll purchase goods here in Italy, I'll bring them to Africa, I'll sell them and take on goods from Africa, bring them back to Italy and sell those goods, and there's going to be some um, <coughs> money that is generated, so there's certain profit margins from those trade routes, and we'll split it. You're the capitalist, you get a three to one split, just like our guys in the first experiment. And that persisted for a few hundred years, up until a bunch of people, uh, were who, who had gotten rich in virtue of this contract device decided that if there were more contracts like this, there would be more wealthy people to share wealth and power in Venice. And so they decided a good idea would be to prohibit the formation of these kinds of mutually profitable transactions. So they said you just can't make contracts like this. And it had exactly the effect that they intended, which is to say many, many fewer people wound up getting wealthy, taking advantage of what Venice had done to that and those individuals who were in power managed to stay in power by suppressing mutually profitable transactions on the part of capitalists and, and potential merchants. And this is why Venice is not today a financial capital and economic capital or what have you. It's a place you go to buy a cute little glass fish, your torts, and go kind of in a gondola to see what's going on. Because the people in power use this legal rule essentially to suppress what other people were able to do to benefit themselves. And I would argue that things like this are the quintessential feature of human history. That if you look and take, if you look at when it is that people have wound up with normative rules that wind up being economically advantageous, even those cases are really people trying to find moral rules that are good for them. I mean, the signing of the Magna Carta, which had incredible knock-on effects in the context of the development of institutions in the United Kingdom and subsequently in all the, the uh, British colonies. These were basically people who were getting pushed around by a would-be dictator, trying to tell them that they were all going to get together and not allow the dictator to take their stuff. So even good norms seem to be born often, I would argue, and I take the point, this is not easily, this is not exactly an empirical issue. Historians of science, historians can disagree about the details of these transactions. But even what wind up being group beneficial norms are often born of individuals who are trying to use norms for selfish reasons. And then as a side effect, you wind up having group beneficial outcomes. So I would say that the group beneficial norm is at least in some part their birth to be understood in the context of what's going on strategically as opposed to what's going on at the level of group-wide aggregate welfare of generation. So I would say that the, this kind of view about morality explains many features of what's going on in terms of people who reach into that world judgments. In other work we've described how we think it explains non-consequentialism, the intuition about impartiality, and most importantly, we think that it explains what's going on in terms of the fights over strategic content. We think the explanation can stretch all the way back to cases like Venice and all the way to the present and to, into the laboratory. So with that, I want to thank the big lab members, all of my collaborators, for those of you who want. I never like to give URLs because people have to write it down. If you just Google Pleep Lab, P L E E P L E B, they'll get access to all the work. These, when I say all the work, of course, what I mean is these guys did all the work, and then I'm up here to uh, take credit for it. And also, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, so we have half.
half an hour for questions, and um, I'm going to let Rob deal the questions himself. Yeah. Hi. Thank you very much. It's very refreshing. If I may take uh, 30 seconds. Um, I was raised up from Korea, child for the Buddhism and the Confucianism. Their, their the principle is that uh, religion and morality is doing good to other people. That's the essence, you know. And uh, uh, when I look at the American society, the GOP, demo, rich, or whatever, bank, or whatever, their morality is uh, self-serving, self-sustaining. They don't care whatever it is. This is what I want. It will make me rich, you know. But the wise men look at the whole program and say, well, it's a good program. There's a minor adjustment needed. So if this program going into effective, it may not good for me. It's a little inconvenient. I make, I'll make uh, less money. But what the heck, you know, if it's good for the people, good for the country, I'll support it. That's what we uh, lacking these days, you know. So uh, your striking morality, I think you're the person had a new movement. What do you say? <laughs> well, thank you, I guess I would say first. The, the second thing I, I would, there's lots of pieces in there, let me address what I think is probably the most important one, and I'll do it in the context of stepping back a little bit from the, from the promise of the model, which is that the, the problem with the notion that you could think of all contents as multiple points in equilibrium space that could have been anything, is that at, at that point you lose predictive power. And so we can't really explain in and of it just with that cross-cultural differences, uh, like the ones you're mentioning between what's going on in Korea, what's going on in the United States, what's going on elsewhere. And then we, we sort of have to say that it could have come out lots of different ways and happened to come out this way in virtue of historical processes which are, which are really, really complicated. Um, so, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you. I mean, I guess I would I would say that um, I guess I'm a little suspicious when people say that the morality of this place or that place is all about pro sociality because I and I we have anthropologists here who know about this more than I do. But um, my guess is that the moral context that what people consider wrong in places like Korea and elsewhere probably uh, extends beyond just altruism and selfishness and pro sociality in, in, into other domains. John Hyde as I mentioned a couple times, has been trying to make this point as vocally as he can, that people are also moralizing you know, sexual transactions and so on. So for example, sex and food choice and so on. These things don't tie in naturally with what you're saying about pro-sociality pro -sociality and, and uh, being in favor of you know, uh, aggregate welfare and so on. And yet, my guess is that people still moralize those things. They still care about what people are doing in that respect. So on one, on one, on one hand, I, I certainly agree with you. And I, I guess where I wind up here is that the problem with the multiple multiple equilibrium story is that we have limited predictive power for for any given case. Because other than a whole kind of cultural evolution model or some kind of epidemiological model, we, we don't have a lot of tools in our toolbox to start figuring out how it's all going to work. But thank you. Yeah. Let me ask one one very general question, one very specific one, to allow you to duck either one gracefully. Um, you started out by talking about moral judgment and immediately ran to negative moral judgment and punishment. And that's certainly, you know, that's, that's the way that, that word's used in English. It's the way you say the cognitive word is used in Hebrew. I'm sure that's quite common. But why not try to explain moral praise and reward in the same terms? Because those are, those are real phenomena. Um, then on your very specific drug model, which is something I'm very interested in, I've never actually tried to use aspirin as a seduction tool, and, and maybe I should. I don't recommend it. And maybe I should. Well, okay, but but then you have to ask the question: Why, if people's attitudes about sex load heavily on their attitudes about aspirin, what kind of sense that makes? Because people do not have aspirin-intensive or aspirin-non-intensive sexual strategies. So if you've done that for all the intoxicants and gotten that result, they would say, "Oh, that sounds right." But when you get it for, I mean, and echinacea, I can just believe that people think, oh, that must be some drug, if you're asking me whether it's okay to use it or not. Yeah. Well, what sense do you make of the aspirin result? So let me take the first one first, and then I'll take the second one second. The, the answer to the first one is that I, the problem with the word morality is that it's used differently by the folk and by the scholarly community. 
And I just think that moral, what's called moral praise, it's just a different phenomenon to be explained, and it's going to have a different explanation. And I mean, I think the explanation is ultimately straightforward, which is that you know, I, I kind of want to live in a world in which other people get rewarded for doing things which are good for lots of other people, even at a cost themselves. So it's kind of nice for me to encourage other people to do pro-social things. I mean, you know, uh, if it were great in here, I would you know, be very happy if uh, Dan sort of thought that the most praiseworthy thing to do would be to jump on top of it. But, but, but I think that that's a different, it's a different phenomenon, and it has a different explanation. So that's why I, I, I don't think that we're going to be able to get explanations for praise out of the same kind of explanation that we can get condemnation. So that's it's just a good thing. The second thing, I mean, yeah, drugs are drugs are weird. So I, I sometimes preface this, but people don't believe me. I actually thought that when Jason and I developed that third project, the drugs project, I was on the other side of it. I thought it was unlikely that people's sexual strategies were going to be closely related to their, to their drug use. And I thought, you know, to figure this out, it, it's kind of a complicated task. You've got to sort of think, ah, oh, people are using a lot of drugs, there's a lot of sex, sex is good for me, bad thing, it's kind of bad for me, so. Um, and this speaks to the question that I had during the presentation about conscious and unconscious. I, I thought it was asking too much of the system. Like, how does it, how does it know? So we got the result once, and it was not in the direction that I thought, and then we got the result the second time, and then I, I gave in, I said, okay, well, let's just write the paper, because I can't explain it any, any other any other story. Um, but that did get us thinking, or me thinking, a bit more about aspirin and echinacea, and so the only thing I would say is that somehow drugs are like a conceptual primitive. It's, it, it's not differentiated by propositional knowledge about the properties of those drugs. It's just this idea of putting stuff in your body that doesn't, that's not food. It's like, there's some category in your head, there's like a conceptual <coughs> primitive of non-food stuff that people put in their head, and it's all just psychologically clumped together, more or less independently of the details, the propositional knowledge that you have about their pharmacological effects. It's, it's like just stuff. So I mean, I know that's not a satisfying answer, so in some ways I did duck it, but um, I mean, it'd be interesting, to, so Clark's me right here, there's lots of work on how, uh, how to get at what is a sort of a psychological primitive, and do these things cluster together? That, that I think is an interesting question. But, I don't want to Yeah. Um, I wanted you to clarify the idea of self-interest for a minute in, in your work, and um, I'll preface that by telling you this little story. It's a, it's a joke about communism. The guy says, he's explaining communism, and he says, so in other words, if you had two tractors, you'd give me one. And he says, yeah. And he says, and if you had two cows, you'd give me one. And he said, no. The guy says, well, why not? He says, well, I have two cows. I don't have two tractors. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, that I think that in terms of um, when you're talking about self-interest, um, I'd like to know whether you clarify this idea of self as being the objective self or the subjective self. In other words, we could go against our own self-interest uh, at, at times with certain biases um, that um, is, it, is, is something really in our own self-interest in a way that we understand that? Or is it something uh, that's observed as being in our self-interest that you're observing? So, I, I, again, so to get to the, the notion of psychological primitives, I think people can compute states of the world that are sort of fitness good for them. So good for them in some kind of sense, some, some currency of fitness as a result of the fact that we have the ball lines. And so I don't want to limit self-interest in the way that economists typically have limited it to you know, increasing the wealth of kind of gain or have you. I want to think about it as, as a context of those kinds of things, either objects or states of the world, that will increase statistics as a statistical matter, um, reproductive success. And so I, and I think people are trying to, I mean, and I think there are systems in your head that are computing those across a large number of domains, sexual outcomes and status outcomes and wealth outcomes and so on. So for me, self-interest, I don't, I don't distinguish between objective and subjective. Really what I want to do is talk about complications that are designed to figure out which, which are better, which are worse states in the world with respect to all the different adaptive problems that you might have. And the answers to all of those things, I think, you can put in this big basket of self-interest. That's what I would say. I love that stuff. Yeah. I'd like to, first of all, follow up on Is the analogy, is the situation I now construct analogous to your uh, typist example? Um, uh, beyond the veil of ignorance, I opt for a judicial procedure to determine guilt, which requires a unanimity verdict and the jury and proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I conclude that that's fair. Um, I'm then on 
use that as evidence that it was my self-interest now that was revising my judgment? Did you want to ask her other two things? Well, I'll travel back. The other, the other is more complicated. More complicated than that. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not sure I would have put it that way. I wouldn't have said it's evidence. I would say that's the kind of thing which I would expect based on these kinds of ideas. So you should, right, so again, behind the veil, people should be in favor of lots of different kinds of procedural justices. As long as, as, long as you're behind the veil, after the veil, right, so in the, 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 the bad outcome, you know, I would expect people would, you know, the, the jury was tampered with, the judge was biased, and you know, that's exactly what happens. I, I don't think you need my model to sort of explain that. Right. Right. No, I think what, what's concerning me is this. Um, there is a distinction procedural justice and substantive justice. What I know is that I did not deserve the verdict that I got because I'm innocent. Even though I proved uh, the procedural process, it's not self-interest that has shifted my perspective. My perspective has remained the same. It's now in, uh, it's supplemented by my reference to substantive justice. And that's what I think is taking uh, place in the Titus case. It's not the self-interest. It's what's come into play is a different notion of, of justice. It's like the difference between procedural justice in the law and uh, 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 justice guided by desert. It's not strategic. I'm not sure how to respond to that. I mean, so uh, even if even if you think that, uh, even if you want to make this distinction, surely, the, in either case, you're, what, what's driving your position with respect to the, the procedural justice or any other sort of justice, one that is still located in where your interests are. But if you didn't get the outcome that you like, the notion of liking just is a commitment to the notion of interest, right? Well, it seems to me that it's, uh, my judgment in the case is not guided by my self-interest when I that was an unjust result, even though I agree that the procedure was fair. There are two types of justice involved here. One is corrective justice, and the other is procedural justice. You can't infer that it was self-interest that was motivating me. What was motivating me was the sense, I'm innocent, and I've been found guilty. I, cer I certainly think the procedures were just, but they made a mistake. One way to phrase yeah. um, what our colleague here is suggesting is that the experience is a source of empirical updating, right? But the only way that, that you could fit that with the typist result would be that people don't really know how much work it takes to type three paragraphs until they do it, and then they realize that that's very effortable, and as a consequence of that, they think it's more worthwhile to have a, a three line split. And I think. You know, that's in the realm of possible, but it's extremely plausible to remember that people are interacting through a computer. Excuse me, did the, did the, the, <coughs> there's an experiment to do to do to check whether it's experience or self-interest, which is to put somebody through the type of status and then say, okay, we're going to do this again, and next time you're going to have the checker pass. But now tell me what's fair. So okay. you have the checkers have a, the checkers change their position. They, I mean, they, so and that the checkers haven't done three and done the one. Uh, so, I mean, on your view, if you think it has to do with the experience of doing three paragraphs, would you expect the same directional effect on the guys who are only doing one? No, not 100%. Sure. Yeah. But um, we remember also that we, so we, have, the tween, we have the tween data, so. Um, right, right, so, I mean, consistent with his suggestion, it would have to be that you don't realize how difficult it is to check until you've checked. And then you say, oh, checking is a very demanding task. Checkers deserve more, right? And again, I just don't find that a plausible argument empirically. Yeah. Um, it may very well be that um, self interest plays a role in lots of the context that you're referring to, all that I'm suggesting is that in this particular context, uh, what one has is a, um, a conjoinder of two different kinds of issues of justice. Well, let me ask you this. Suppose, suppose you go to trial and you were bound innocent for something you actually did. 
doesn't your abuse just really irritate at that point because you know it's factual matter that you've got the wrong outcome? I'm going to go out on a limb and say that never happens. No one stands up and after things found innocent and says, you fools, like, the procedure was great, but you got the wrong outcome. And that little thought experiment tells you it's got to be that self-interest is driving the difference between those two cases. Well, found innocent by acting. What, what judgment is the person now? So if someone is incorrectly. Who, who's found that the jury made a mistake, that he was in fact guilty. What judgment is being made that shouldn't by self-interest? You're claiming after the fact that, so the, that you're, you're suggesting that the person is re negatively reacting to the verdict in virtue of something other than the procedural justice is objecting to the outcome. Yeah. Does that outcome have a bad outcome? And I'm yes. saying, it, it, I'm saying no one objects to the error as long as the error is in their favor. That's fine. True. So people stand up and say, you, you fools, I actually killed the guy? No, no, no. I think what you're leaving out, and the discussion generally is leaving out the concept of self-condemnation. That's precisely where one's conscience may come into play. I think there are other questions. Yeah, let me move on. Yeah. It's related to my question. With regard to his point, you make a big deal in your book about humans being the most social of animals. So that we're, we engage in many behaviors that are very costly to ourselves to please others, to retain membership in groups, whether it's families, friends, or larger groups. One of the ethical norms that we have, at least in this country, is you're innocent until proven guilty. If it were possible to stick in another person's mind the fact that he was innocent, would that other person who was not guilty not say that was an unjust result? That's a social context that we don't want that imposed on me, that innocence should be found guilty. In other words, we start with a moral premise to try and avoid that situation. And it's because the information content in the jurors was not the same as in his, and, there, and that the defense was not sufficient to transfer that information. If people really knew that he was not guilty, they would find the result unjust. That's not a self-interest. That is a social interest. And so extending my argument this way, in the book, you talk about a situation unlike the typing book, unlike the typing situation. Both sides know that there is an option for, for the decider to take $6 and give $1 to the other side, or 5 and 5. When both sides are aware, the result is usually 5 and 5, which is the socializing of the human animal. We don't want to be seen as being unfair. But in the work situation, the unfairness comes because it's clear that somebody's put in more effort than another person. So my question is, ideologically, is part of the problem for the polarization that we are stroking different friendship groups, and those moralities then start fighting each other. So that the moralities are frequently a consequence of socializing processes where we want to maintain group membership. Okay, there's a lot in there. So let me take that last piece and try to, try to address it a little bit. So let me, let me do it this way. So right, one way to read what I'm saying seems to fly in the face of the, the, of, um, the, the, the kind of coherence one sees example of political parties. And I absolutely think it's true that, and this is in the more, in the upcoming book, especially for issues which don't really affect the individual all that much, people are relatively happy to adopt the moral, political, ideological position of their fellow coalitional members. So, um, you know, uh, people who are in rooms like this one, hyper-educated, white, high social capital Democrats, 
they, they do wind up breaking left on affirmative action in no small, according to our view, in no small part because that makes them good coalition members with the African American component of the Democratic Big Three Party. I, I can see that. So, and I, I'm happy to say, so our prediction would be that kind of adoption of a political view in virtue of one's group membership, that should be strongest in the cases in which the individual in question doesn't have a relatively clear self-interested self -interested stake. And the, the place to look for that are where people deviate from their party uh, platforms. So where you have subgroups that are deviating from a particular client. And again, we I, I don't want to sit here and just talk the book and thank you for reading the prior one. But uh, we think there's lots of cases like that. Not, not, a, not a ton, but uh, a lot of cases. So, um, and actually, rich, educated, super educated, super rich white folk in the Democratic Party sort of like that. So it's weird that people in this room are so in favor of wealth transfers from the wealthy to the poor because you guys are all rich. And yet, uh, but that makes you good Democrats. It makes you coalition well with uh, the mainstay of one of the huge branches of the Democratic Party, which is uh, you know, uh, blue collar workers and African Americans of various socioeconomic levels. So I credit your position. And I'm not saying that the coalitional elements don't matter. It's particularly important in a two party system that, as one has in this country. What we find is, of course, political coherence gets higher, not surprisingly, as the number of political parties in the politics. Um, but uh, so that's also, anyway, so I, I think that in, in, in some sense I agree with you, and then now we're starting to go to details, so, and I'm happy to do that. Yeah. It, it seems to me, and I may have missed this in some of the places along the line, but uh, it seems to me that there's a, there's a difference between first order self interest and second or third order self interest. Uh, first order self interest is that I don't get hurt right at this instant, or I, I get some reward right at this instant. Second order would be that it maybe happens to me or it doesn't happen to me or the case may be someplace down the line. Uh, and a couple of examples of this. I like being a citizen of, the, a citizen of the United States. But if I happen to break the speed limit or get caught breaking the speed limit, you know, I don't like that. Uh, but I do like being a citizen of the United States. Okay? So if I run across some law or whatever, then I don't like that. And I think, well, that's unfair. The law shouldn't be there. Yeah. But I like a law-abiding society. Uh, that would explain why some people get along in, in dictatorships. Because, you know, everything's stable. You know, it may not be fair, but it's stable. Uh, another example would be, let's say I become a soldier. Well, I want the big pay that the DOD gives me. Okay, maybe I want a little adventure and so forth, but I don't want to get killed. Okay, so I've taken, I've made a judgment here on a first order um, advantage, if you will, the big pay that you know essentially our mercenary army has today, uh, and uh, you know I, I'm making, I'm taking a chance that I'm not going to get shot. But uh, and 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 that's a sort of a second order. So I was wondering whether in these experiments you were sort of making uh, slices in terms of self-interest so that some of them were immediate and some of them were down the line and some of them had probabilities related to them and so forth. So I wouldn't use, I wouldn't use the term order there. So it seems like you're talking about <coughs> a, dis a distinction between, but in the speeding case, I don't think people <coughs> caught speeding don't like speeding laws. They don't like getting caught. So you know, after my last speeding ticket, which of course was many years ago, um, I didn't feel like I didn't feel like the, the country shouldn't have laws against speeding. I felt that there should be fewer cops in North Carolina. Um, so I, I don't think that the, the getting caught comes to you against the regime. It, it, it's irritating, um, and certainly people who get caught. My sense is that people who get caught speeding still like laws against it. So I don't think it, that that's not sufficient. I think to, to change people's views around. Having said that, there is, I think there is something very deep about one, one piece that you got at, which is um, you do have to, so the unemployment insurance, I think, is a good case. I actually think flood insurance is even better. So the people who like federal flood insurance are not restricted to people whose houses are currently damaged by floods. They're people who, with higher probabilities, are likely to have their houses damaged by floods. That is to say, you can't look at their self-interest now. It would be nice if the federal government wrote me a check for my damaged house, 
you have to look at their expected value with respect to the particular policy issue, right? So people on the Jersey Shore, uh, people on the Outer Banks, these guys, they think federally subsidized health uh, flood insurance is a great idea. And um, they're not underwater, but, they're, but probabilistically they're at risk, they're much greater risk than the, than the rest of us who live at you know, kind of sea level. So, uh, and that I think is important to think about, and it's not, you're right, you didn't miss it, it's not in here. But it is something I think that's important to think of in, in policy. It's alluded to a little bit in the data that I showed you with respect to affirmative action, because that has this kind of feature of, and unemployment is the same way. The people who really think that unemployment, yes, unemployed people, they like unemployment insurance. That's true. And they like those benefits to be extended. Also, people who think that they are at risk for being downsized or whatever the euphemism in the States is, those guys also like federal unemployment insurance, not because they want the money to pay, but because they're at greater risk than, than other people who are answering the survey questions. And that, I think, is an important point. And some people have acknowledged that, and some people put less weight on that. But I absolutely think that's right. Yeah. Uh, and the question that you said that you're surprised that this white group of people here are so self-democrat and willing to be part of wealth, that is not against self-interest. What it is, is that there are much prefer if you're uh, poor, uh, you will commit crime. So in this way, they're buying insurance and not they're paying it not only themselves, but this premium <coughs> is done at the expense of everyone to create a neighborhood where they don't get killed. So why so why are rich Republicans not fit for wealth transfers? Because they say benefit the same you No, know, I think that you're misunderstanding <coughs> that. I think there are poor property rights and for engage in a capitalistic way. I don't think they're against basically subsidizing, but they're against subsidizing people who do not actually work and you're making them poorer. That's certainly the way they put it, but your claim is that you can understand wealth transfers in virtue of self-interest, but in order then to explain the party differences in respect of their endorsement or support for these rules, you have to explain why some people who are in exactly the same position with respect to their self-interest in terms of wealth transfers, if they're on the left, take one view, and if they're on the right, take, take another. I mean, I'm not saying that Republicans don't put it in the context exactly as you say, of small government property. That's exactly the rhetoric. Our point, what we're trying to do, and this we is now Jason, is, is try to say, all we need to do is look at a relatively small vocabulary of your demographic property, and we can pick out what your position is going to be, and all we need to do is look at the demographic property and speak to the issue of your self-interest. And then we add on a little component which has to do with the fact that Democrats are this weird, unholy, Mongol monster that couples together extremely diverse uh, policies. Um, and then we think we can get most of the diversity of political opinion. All I'm saying is that I, I take your point that there are lots of different reasons why different individuals ought to have you know, positions with respect to wealth transfers and so on. But, but if you find that this clump of people has this view, and this couple of people has this view, and yet they have the, the same features in terms of, for example, their income, then you need to have some other variable which explains why it is that these guys come out on this side and these guys come out on the other. You know, you, you, right, you can't use the fact that they, right? I mean, so if it were just that rich people are better off than poor people or poor people, then everyone is rich off to pay for wealth transfers. But that's not what we find at all. We uh, find rich, rich Democrats, this is a slight exaggeration, but rich Democrats do and rich Republicans don't. They're not that different. You just, they're both living in the United States, aren't they? It is sort of a balance of power. There are minute sort of differences to differentiate them and put them in a net working group of people. So it's a very minor sort of differences. They're not major differences between really Democrats and Republicans. They're minute in the big scheme of things. Well, I'm not prepared to make a claim about how one should characterize those party differences magnitude of the differences as whether they're large or small. I mean, I, I, but they're all self-interest, is what I'm driving at. Well, then we're in agreement. So that's, Absolutely. Uh, that's sort of the point. I am glad you're here and saying it, because I always am uh, in debates with my colleagues who say it's not self-interest. We are better people. You're not better people. You're always working in your self-interest. Well, the, right, so the mainstream, I mean, as you said, as you said one of the science colleagues I, I tend to interact with take the and I'm sure that this quotation is which exactly articulates I agree with you. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time now, so although there are additional questions, I'm afraid we should be
Everything is 